Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And our first story of the day is by Etonas. Don't use anything except Windows? Sure, have it your way. Some six years ago, I worked in a small IT services shop that had an extremely liberal bring your own device policy. You could use anything you wanted as long as it got the job done and does not introduce any problems into the client's network or infrastructure. Sounds fair enough. As I've been using Linux for almost two decades, and most of my job is centered around sending emails or traveling to the client's offices to diagnose any problems, I figured a Linux machine would not compromise my workflow much. Most of those devices are network appliances which are managed either by a command line or a web-based GUI. And if the device in question was a standard server running Windows, I could RDP into it using X-Free RDP. Nothing that specifically required Windows. Now mind you, desktop Linux had its own fair share of craps and problems that Windows users will never ever encounter. Even by today's, yes in 2021, standards. Teething and long-standing problems like laptops failing to resume after suspend, mysterious hardware issues caused by the kernel drivers, the Linux sound system and graphics system failing to properly switch over after the laptop's been connected to an external display or projector, X suddenly throwing a fit and deciding it doesn't want to start up the desktop GUI, and on and on. It's one thing when these problems happen at home, but it's a totally different level of pissed off and frustration while they happen while at work. Naturally, my clients didn't appreciate me taking longer than usual to address their issues when Linux decides to act up. But since I generally manage to, eventually, resolve their problems, they tend to close one eye as a professional courtesy. Besides, it also meant that they could seek me out for free advice on certain issues that involved their Linux servers, in exchange for their silence on my laptop's mishaps. My manager thought differently though. To him, it was an embarrassment for a support staff's laptop to be running into all kinds of problems while at a client's premises. Finally, after one too many mishaps, he chewed me out big time. Manager, after a presentation where my laptop decided to pull a Murphy and started flashing a nice mess of colors and lines over the projector in the middle of the session, most X or graphic drivers were, and are still a complete joke today, had said, you. How many times has this been? I say I'm sorry, sir. The manager says, don't give me that. From now on, you will only use Windows and your laptop. Do I make myself clear on this? Now, in all fairness, I was already considering a switch to Windows 8, Windows 10 was not released yet, for my work laptop because of all the little paper cuts that I had to use with on Linux. Habit, and because I'm used to it, has no influence on the matter when work is concerned. But at the same time, I was petty enough that I felt the urge to put up some form of token resistance, if only just even the score, so to speak. Regardless, I took out the hard disk containing Linux from my laptop, installed a new hard disk in its place, and performed a clean installation of Windows 8, and life was so much better. Still, I kept the old hard disk in a portable case in my bag at all times with a set of screwdrivers, should there ever be any need for it. One fine day, I followed my manager to another client's site to inspect some networking issues. The client was running a network test appliance in their lab network. This tester generates garbage, but proper network traffic to a defined destination IP address, and they were wondering why the destination was only receiving less than 1% of the garbage they were expecting to see. Now, I'm way out of my league here. I have no formal training or certifications in networking outside of my own experiences and self-study and informed the client as such, but they weren't bothered. They assured me that they just wanted to exhaust all possibilities as to why the destination node wasn't getting the garbage they were supposed to see, and it would be a learning experience for all the people involved, including themselves. With that assurance in mind, I had them lead me to the destination node, which was a workstation running on Windows 7 with Wireshark to perform a packet capture of all incoming traffic. First alarm bell starts going off. Before I could even say anything, my manager cut in and said that it's probably because they were using Windows 7 for the destination node and that my laptop with Windows 8 may produce better results. I swear, I had to fight the urge to roll my eyes on hearing this. And when I tried to explain to him how unlikely a newer version of Windows would even solve anything, he brushed it off, saying that we should try everything, 
Well, if he wants to make a fool of himself, I'm game. Cue the malicious compliance. For the two hours, he kept giving me all manner of instructions and suggestions which naturally did not work. Changing the MTU size, changing the NIC settings, applying certain Windows updates, etc. And I had no desire to oppose him in making a fool of himself. Finally, when he was about to call it quits as the client's working hours were about to end, I asked the client if they could tell me a little more about the traffic that was being generated by the network tester. They said, oh, all kinds of traffic. GRE, MPLS, VLAN and stacked VLANs. Fiber channel, a lot of types actually. Second alarm bell starts going off. For those who are not familiar, hardware network drivers in Windows are usually end user drivers supplied by the vendors of the NIC and submitted to Microsoft for integration purely as a convenience. That is, they are drivers that are designed to be used for nothing more than standard TCP slash IP and UDP IP communication over Ethernet. Any frame or packet that is not recognized by the driver gets dropped silently. No warning, no alert, just dropped. Such drivers are perfect for normal networking, but are almost completely useless for diagnosing enterprise network issues where VLANs, tunnels, and other protocols are commonplace. On the other hand, an NIC driver in Linux usually supports a much more comprehensive network stack and thus has a drastically higher chance in seeing and recording different kinds of network traffic than Windows during a packet capture. So I was fairly certain at this point that there was nothing wrong with their network tester or their lab network at all. It was just the NIC driver in Windows doing exactly what it was supposed to do. Drop any traffic it does not recognize. And ask the client if they could kindly stay back for just about 30 minutes after their working hours for me to try one last option. They agreed, so I took the old Linux hard disk out from my bag and proceeded to do a hard disk swap on my laptop. In the meantime, my manager was grumbling non-stop about me wasting everybody's time and being stubborn and refusing to use Windows as instructed. With the old Linux hard disk installed, I booted up into my old installation, connected the laptop to the network tester, and started T-Shark. Almost immediately, everyone could see my laptop's gigabit port being flooded with traffic, and the packet count was easily more than 30 times what was observed in Windows. Finally, for the coup de grace, I cut the capture and opened the PCAP NG file in Wireshark, which proudly displayed traffic from all the various network protocols previously mentioned. Of course, I also informed the client that there was nothing wrong with their workstation, with Windows, or with the network tester. They just needed to find a modified or debug driver that could recognize such traffic, or otherwise set up a temporary Linux node for their packet capture requirements. On the other hand, my manager was rather PO'd at me for what he claims was wasting two hours of everybody's time, when I already knew what the problem was right from the start, but refused to share it with the others until now. So it was extremely gratifying when the client stepped in and put my manager in his place by pointing out that 1. He never bothered to ask about the traffic type, 2. He assumed that it was a Windows configuration issue, and 3. He never thought to ask me what I thought might be the cause. My manager never spoke to me again after that incident, outside of a half-hearted attempt to retain me when I finally resigned a year later. Although OP proved that they were more than capable and that their rig might prove more useful in situations, would you agree that there's kind of merit on both sides here? The manager would only see the optics of an employee using what seems to be their own solution which ends up being a buggy mess a lot of the time, whereas the employee using that albeit somewhat buggy mess can solve a lot more problems sometimes. Was the boss right? Was OP right? Or do you kind of see both sides? Let me know in the comments down below. This next story is by Joel the Connor. You want to book the hotel? Sure thing, babe. My wonderful family of four are on a trip to visit family and friends. Four years ago, on a trip with the same itinerary as this one, I, husband, booked our hotel as I usually do. I am what you would describe as thrifty, and I don't like spending a ton on hotels when we're basically just sleeping there. The hotel I booked for this leg of the journey was probably not the most high class, and sure, it was not in the safest area of town. This was definitely a hotel where some acts of questionable legality and morality occur, 
In my defense, it was a very last minute booking as we were supposed to be staying with family and there were very few options available under $150 a night. The stay there ended up being fine, but it has been a long running joke between us for the past 4 years. We're now visiting for the first time in 4 years. I went to book the hotel and my wife said, no way, it's my hometown and I'm doing it this time. So she pulls up ye old Priceline and starts looking at places, specifically looking for a place with a pool for the littles. She looks at one, reads the reviews and details, and says it looks good, especially for the lower price. She even calls to make sure the pool is open because of COVID. I look at the photos and look back at her thinking she was making a joke. She was not. I just smiled and said, whatever you think, babe. Yep, you know what's coming. As we approach the hotel, I see a look of confusion slowly wash over her face. She says, wait, is this? And trails off. I reply with a resounding, yep, it sure is. She booked us in the exact same hotel that she's been griefing me about for four years. I laughed and laughed and laughed. She cannot believe she did it and also thinks it's hilarious. I am vindicated. See, maybe it isn't so easy saving some money and picking out a good place. Maybe OP's judgment's better than you thought? This next story is by Sir Scruffington. Can't have drinks on the floor? Fine. I work as a fabricator for a company that's mainly known as a supplier of extrusion and sheet, so I fall outside of the new rule set in place. The warehouse staff, those who pick and pack orders at a fast pace and deal with customers, have just had a proverbial hammer brought down onto them. As you could imagine, handling of heavy or large quantities of material while rushing around will make you hot and tired. Water and other drinks are the go-to to keep going through your break. As such, management in their infinite wisdom has decreed that if you are seen with a drink on the floor, then you will receive an immediate written warning. All because there's the potential to somehow leave a watermark on the material. Their advised action is to head to the break room to have a drink instead. As a side note, lots of small sips of water is better than a big gulp, especially when dehydrated. Safety first. So the guys are doing exactly that? Walking off the floor several times a day just to have a sip of water and then back to work? Have this occur among seven people and the productivity has declined. One particular worker got pulled up about it and he simply said he was following the rules without compromising his health. Currently, the management is trying to work their way around it, but the fallout is a drop in productivity and a workforce that's safe behind the rules. How dare you guys not act like robots and not need water? It's simply inhumane for what they're trying to achieve, which is having no water on the floor and absolutely minimum visits to the break room. Not only is that most likely illegal to try and prevent, but yeah, it's outright inhumane. And our final story of the day is by long-suffering squid, Memorial Day shenanigans. It's Memorial Day this coming Monday, which means a three-day weekend for me and my coworkers. As typical, many of us have made plans for those three, involving family, trips, and barbecuing. So yesterday, Tuesday, management comes to us and asks us to come in that weekend to do some extra work. No one is particularly happy to hear this, since the extra work only exists because of management's screw-ups. Management states that they're aware that many of us have plans this weekend, so if we could just let them know who's available to work, that would be great. It being only Tuesday, and my being at work where management doesn't want us playing on our phones, I resolve to talk to my family about my working part of the weekend. I'm not terribly eager, but they are offering a bonus to those who come in. A few hours later, a manager starts going desk to desk confirming who will be working that weekend. I mentioned that I haven't had a chance yet to talk to my family about rearranging our plans. The manager's response, well, we really need to know now. I shrug, okay, then no, I can't come in, my family has plans. The manager tries backpedaling, asking if I could check with my family first, but nope. I am not going to be bullied or guilted into fixing the mess that management created in the first place. I'm definitely proud of OP for standing up in this situation. Clearly that manager was trying to pressure and guilt them. A lot of people, like me, who are, for better or worse, intrinsically wanting to be people pleasers, would have most likely have caved in and said, okay, I'll be there. But not OP, they stuck to their guns and they have morals and principles. 
But with that being said, that's a wrap on another bunch of stories. As always, if you guys have any favorite videos of this bunch, let me know which one in the comments down below and why. And if you enjoyed the stories in general, if you could subscribe to this channel, it'd mean a lot to me. I make these videos daily, and it's by far and away the best way to support my channel. So no matter what you did, whether it was subscribing or liking, leaving a comment, I just appreciate the heck out of you guys. And as always, I'll be back tomorrow with even more stories right here on the Storytime channel.